Starbase was silent early last week, with minimal activities due to unfavorable weather and an Arctic outbreak that brought bone-chilling temperatures to Texas. Rocket testing and related activities resumed on Thursday, December 29, with a cryo-proof test of Super Heavy Booster 9. Liquid nitrogen loading into the oxygen tank of the booster began at 2.54 p.m. local time on Thursday, and it was filled to roughly 10% of its capacity in 7 minutes. After holding it in that state for about 30 minutes, the tank was fully drained. After almost wholly detanking the oxygen tank, liquid nitrogen filling into the methane tank began, and it took SpaceX an hour to slowly fill the methane tank to roughly 80% of its maximum capacity. After keeping the tank filled for about 25 minutes, SpaceX drained the tank and concluded the second cryo-proof test of Booster 9. The cryo-proof test provides engineers with the data they need to determine whether the rocket can endure internal stresses and whether the structure has any leaks. The road closure notice suggests rocket testing at Starbase will only resume on Friday, January 6. The Ring Watchers recently posted a series of tweets explaining how SpaceX's latest super heavy prototype, Booster 9, differs from its predecessors. Let's go through those tweets to discover more about Booster 9. Super Heavy Booster 9 will feature Raptor engines with electric thrust vector control systems. As a result, hydraulic power units are no longer needed on Booster 9, reducing the vehicle's total mass. The electric thrust vector control system, in Elon Musk's estimation, would save over a ton of hydraulic mass on the booster. The system will also feature simpler hardware, making it much easier to control the engine while in flight. Several Raptor engines that feature electric thrust vector control systems have already arrived at Starbase. More such Raptors are being tested at SpaceX's engine development and test facility in McGregor, Texas. I have discussed these upgraded Raptor engines in my previous video, please check out that video from the link in the description below. Compared to Boosters 7 and 8, Booster 9 features a revised thrust puck design. More metal is removed from the puck, reducing its total mass. The Booster 7.1 test tank that underwent a structural stress test in August featured a similar thrust puck design. One of the goals of the Booster 7.1 structural stress test was to validate the new thrust puck design. New hardware has been added to the thrust dome of Booster 9, which could be a component of the electric thrust vector control system. The large pipe that delivers liquid methane to the 13 inner engines of the booster is pre-mounted on the thrust puck of Booster 9. This will make the Raptor engine installation on the booster much quicker and easier. According to Elon Musk, Booster 9 Raptor engines will feature shields to prevent accidents during testing or launch. The composite overwrapped pressure vessels, batteries, and related hardware under the chines of the booster are rearranged on Booster 9, moreover, Starlink dishes have been installed over the chines. On Boosters 7 and 8, all four chines are of equal length, but on Booster 9, two chines are shorter than the other two. The forward dome of Booster 9 now has new bracing, and the exterior faces of the grid fins now contain additional plates. These modifications will add strength to the forward dome and grid fins. The methane and oxygen tank vent ports on Booster 9 also underwent minor revisions that will change the shape of the vent. Thanks to the ring watchers, we now have an overview of some of the design changes that SpaceX made to Booster 9. But don't forget the fact that most Booster 9 upgrades are still a secret. Early on Friday morning, a spreader bar, also known as a spreader beam, two self-propelled modular transporters, and a crane were brought to the launch site. A spreader bar is a simple bar that holds two slings apart and distributes the weight over two or more pick points. Two lugs on top of the bar are each attached at an angle with a chain or sling connected to the crane. Until now, starships were raised and lowered from suborbital launch pads by connecting a crane to lifting points set up on the nose cones of the ships. Ships can now be raised by connecting a crane to the lifting jig, attached to the lifting points underneath the forward flaps. Starship Gazer has recently spotted parts of the Starship lifting jig at Starbase ready for assembly. In this image, you can see the Starship lifting pins fitted on the jig pieces. These pins will be attached to the lifting points under the forward flaps to raise the ship. The pins are similar to the lifting pins on the tower arms that connect to the ship to lift it to stack on top of a super heavy booster. The delivery of modular transporters, a crane, and a spreader bar means Ship 24 may soon be lifted off suborbital pad B and transported back to the build site. Or perhaps the transporters were brought in to take Booster 9 back to the build site. Super Heavy Booster 10 assembly work is progressing inside the Mega Bay. The methane transfer tube, also known as the downcomer, was moved into the Mega Bay on December 27 and installed into the booster's oxygen tank section hours later. Booster 10's basic structure will be complete once the aft oxygen and methane tank sections are joined. 
You may remember the Starship test tank, labeled Ship 26.1, which was moved from the Starbase build site to a nearby SpaceX test facility on December 12. That test tank recently completed its structural stress test and is ready to return to Starbase. Recently, 20 Raptor blast and heat shields were removed from the shielding shelves at the build site. They probably might have gone into the mega bay for installation on Booster 7. Once the shields for the outer 20 engines are in place and all other work to be completed inside the mega bay is finished, Booster 7 will proceed to the launch site to resume pre-launch tests. The booster will first go through a 33-engine static fire test. If that test passes without any anomalies, the next step will be a full-stack wet dress rehearsal on the orbital launch mount. If Ship 24 and Booster 7 complete all pre-launch tests as planned and SpaceX secures a launch license without delay, we will likely witness the Starship's first orbital mission in the first quarter of 2023. Now, let's discuss some of the major science and technology updates from the past week. SpaceX launched a Falcon 9 rocket topped with 54 Starlink Internet satellites into orbit on December 28 from Cape Canaveral Space Force Station in Florida. About eight and a half minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage returned to Earth and landed on a SpaceX drone ship stationed in the Atlantic Ocean. It was the 11th successful landing for this particular booster. About 19 minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9 upper stage released the 54 satellites into a 530 km orbit inclined 43 degrees to the equator. According to SpaceX, the Starlink network now has more than 1 million active subscribers. To help reduce network stress caused by rising consumer demand and improve coverage over lower latitude regions, SpaceX is planning to launch second-generation Starlink satellites in the near future. The only launch vehicle that can accommodate the larger and more powerful Gen 2 satellites is SpaceX's Starship. But with the Starship's first orbital test flight still on hold, SpaceX is planning to start launching a miniature version of the Gen 2 satellites on Falcon 9 rockets very soon. The, the Sonic uh, V2 satellites are, are very large and, uh, and, and too big to fit in a Falcon 9. If the Starship is program uh, is delayed uh, longer than expected, we'd launch a sort of a, small, a smaller uh, Starlink V2 kind of mini that would fit on a Falcon 9. The satellites launched on December 28 were deployed into the orbital shell reserved for the second generation Starlink satellites. However, the flight parameters suggest that the Starlink satellites launched on Wednesday are the same size as the Starlink version 1.5 satellites and not the large Gen 2 satellites or their miniature version. Almost two days after the Starlink mission, SpaceX launched its final mission of 2022 from Vandenberg Space Force Base in California aboard a Falcon 9 rocket. The mission carried Israel's Earth Resources Observation Satellite C3, or EROS C3, into orbit. The rocket was launched retrograde to the Earth's rotation to deploy the satellite into its intended orbit. About eight minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9 first stage returned to Earth with a landing on a SpaceX landing pad, located a short distance from Vandenberg's launch pad. The landing, which was the 11th successful landing for this particular booster, marked the 160th successful landing of SpaceX's orbital rocket. About 15 minutes after liftoff, the Falcon 9 upper stage deployed the payload into a non-sun synchronous retrograde orbit, inclined 148 degrees to the equator. The 400-kilogram EROS C3 is an Earth observation electro-optical satellite built to enable defense and intelligence organizations to conduct operations under complete confidentiality and data protection. The satellite is capable of photographing a swath of 11.5 kilometers and has a resolution of 30 centimeters for grayscale images and 60 centimeters for multispectral imagery. The first ever EROS satellite, EROS A, was launched in 2000 and re entered Earth's atmosphere in 2006. Little information is known about the fleet's active and future members, presumably due to Israeli national security concerns. The December 30th mission marked SpaceX's 61st launch of 2022, nearly doubling the company's previous record of 31 flights, set in 2021. All 61 of those missions, including the booster landings, were fully successful. China holds the record for most orbital launches in 2022. The nation launched 64 missions, 62 of which were successful. In total, 186 missions were sent into space in 2022, 178 of which ended up being a full success. The Russian Space Agency has determined the origin of the coolant leak aboard a Soyuz spacecraft docked at the International Space Station. The leak occurred on December 14, and the video from the space station showed liquid spewing out from the rear section of the Soyuz MS-22 spacecraft docked to the RASBIT module of the space station. The spacecraft's external surface was inspected with cameras installed on the Canaderm II robotic arm after the incident, and the scans revealed a hole in its radiator exterior. 
The hole was around 0.8 millimeters wide, and according to preliminary estimates, the damage could have been caused by a micrometeoroid or space debris. The leaky Soyuz capsule ferried U.S. astronaut Frank Rubio and cosmonaut Sergei Prokopyev and Dmitry Pedelin to the space station in September for a six-month mission. The capsule was set to return to Earth in March carrying astronauts, but it is currently uncertain whether the spacecraft will be able to make it. If a rescue Soyuz craft is needed, it could only come in February, which means the three ISS crew members have no lifeboat in case of emergency till then. NASA is currently investigating whether SpaceX's Crew Dragon spacecraft can offer an alternative ride home for the space station crew members if the rescue Soyuz spacecraft launch is delayed. Sending crew members home in a SpaceX vehicle would require a separate Crew Dragon launch and a separate set of spacesuits that are usually custom-made for astronauts ahead of launch. NASA and Roscosmos are continuing to conduct a variety of engineering reviews for safely bringing the Soyuz crew home, a final decision on the path forward is expected in the coming days. NASA's budget for 2023 includes funding for a second moon lander alongside the SpaceX Starship. Space News reports that Congress approved $25.384 billion for NASA in its $1.7 trillion omnibus bill passed in December 23, including full funding for a second Artemis program moon lander to supplement SpaceX's Starship lunar lander. The human landing system contract aims to provide a means for astronauts to land on the lunar surface. NASA has already secured transportation on SpaceX's Starship for the Artemis 3 and Artemis 4 missions. But following instructions from the U.S. Senate, NASA is requesting other firms to participate in future landings. In response to the most recent call for proposals, two key teams have agreed to provide lunar human landing services. For the national team, which also consists of Lockheed Martin, Draper, Boeing, Astrobotic, and Honeybee Robotics, Blue Origin is in the lead. Northrop Grumman, which collaborated with Blue Origin during the last bidding opportunity in 2020, was elected to partner with Dynetics. Be sure to check out the link in the description if you're interested in learning more about NASA's fiscal year 2023 budget. With this, we have covered all the major updates from last week. Please share your thoughts on the latest science news and Starship updates in the comments section. Also, do not forget to subscribe to the channel for more weekly updates. And as always, thanks for watching.